General Government Operations will go ahead and convene this roundtable. Um, we're here to discuss Bill 221-33, uh, introduced by Senator Ugin, who's joined me to my, and you see to my immediate left. This is an act to amend subsection E of subsection 26202, chapter 26, title 11, Guam Code annotated relative to the business privilege tax on contractors. And um, before uh, we um, go around the round table and uh, have everybody introduce themselves, I'd like to give a moment to uh, Senator Frank Ugin to be able to give us um, a reintroduction of um, why um, Bill 221-33 was introduced and why we've uh, gathered everybody here today to be able to discuss it. Senator Ugin. Uh, thank you, Senator Ugin. Uh, of particular note of the 221-33 is the intent for us to be able to make sure that um, subcontractors are not being subject to the same taxation that their prime contractor was already subject to and thus paying taxes twice on the same um, contract. And so um, what we've wanted to do is gather um, some of the um, stakeholders to be able to discuss whether or not Bill 221-33 is going to clearly achieve that objective, and most particularly to bring with us, and I, and I thank um, John Camacho, the Director of Revenue Tax, for joining us, to be able to clarify and make sure that the exact language in here is going to um, not only achieve that particular um, objective, but not uh, have any... Um, uh, subsequent uh, uh, impacts that, that may be unforeseen. So at this time, I go, I'd like to go ahead and um, have everybody introduce themselves for the records so that we can go ahead and have it for um, uh, the committee reports purposes. Uh, starting to my um, immediate left, if we can just go around the room and have everybody uh, introduce yourselves, uh, state your name, and um, the entity to which you're representing. Uh, David Hicks with America's Best Electric Mart. Good afternoon. This is Albert Titano Yanger with GPSI Guam. Uh, James Martinez with the Guam Contractors Association. Uh, James Martinez with the Guam Contractors Association. Teresita Hagen with uh, Hagen's Inc., DBA Pacific Pest Control. Philip Hagen from Pacific Pest Control. John Camachi, Director of the Department of Revenue and Taxation. Nats Catalos of BBR Micronesia Corp. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. At this time, um, I'd like to just go ahead and turn it over directly to John. Uh, have you reviewed, uh, had an opportunity to review Bill 221? And if you can speak to the intent that I brought up earlier and whether or not um, this will um, satisfy that intent and also whether or not it may or may not um, create any um, unintended uh, ramifications. John? I, I believe that one of the causes that I triggered this, I believe, is this bill, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, the off island contractors that are really coming in um, don't necessarily have to, or, or by law, don't really get a contractor's license number, basically if they practically only do businesses within the federal government. And, uh, but likewise, I guess, they, they still need to register with, um, with the uh, Department of Revenue Taxation as for their business here, and they would still need to get a, a, a service license at least. And I believe the bill proposes that uh, in addition to the contractor's license uh, uh, board number and all the other uh, uh, agencies like professional engineers, architects, and, and land surveyors, uh, basically, which they get their numbers from their own board, uh, this will probably satisfy the, the, uh, mainly the uh, outside contractors not, go, not obtaining those numbers with, with the boards. So um, in the past, we, we had a lot of um, uh, inquiries from contractors, from the Chamber of Commerce, from even the association itself, so an in interpretation. And I think one of the best options that we, we talk about this is to actually amend the law and, and, and make it uh, amendable for these people that could not get this license by law. So with respect in particular, because this bill is pretty simple, it only has an, a single line added on page two on lines 19 to 20. Would the addition of this, um, at, at, uh, would of this language um, be sufficient to ensure that um, subcontractors are not getting double taxed and also to ensure that their prime contractor is, um, is going to be accountable for that, for, for the full um, tax amount? 
I, yes, I, I, I believe uh, in, a, in a prime contractor who's now the responsible uh, payer for this uh, uh, revenues that are collected, uh, basically in order for them to not pay for these uh, uh, taxes that are already paid for when they actually uh, uh, issue those money basically to the subcontractors, they, they don't get taxed twice. So that's basically what this, this, this is for. Uh, the, the reason why I wanted to convene the round table was because I know that um, of, with respect particularly to the military buildup, one of the, um, in a previous bill that um, we uh, had uh, a hearing for, one of the concerns was um, identifying whether or not the, um, these large contractors will in fact be held um, to pay for their GRT. And so for example, if we had a large contractor get a hundred million dollar contract for um, a project up in the base. Mm -hmm. um, but that contract um, and that contractor, uh, um, they're, they're not headquartered here on Guam, they're stationed out of Idaho, for example, right? Um, the question becomes, you know, would they be subject to the GRT? How do we ensure that we're able to capture that? Because with this legislation, assuming, let, let's say, for example, they're not subject to the GRT, then that means that of that $100 million that they're contracted for, they they would not have paid any GRT on it initially, and then it would be paid to the subcontractors, and that's the way that we'd potentially capture any gross receipts taxes from the um, from that particular contract. Um, so the, I guess the first question is, um, would an off-island contractor that gets a contract from the federal government to do a project on the base be subject to GRT? Yes, that is true. Um, uh, basically, the, the, um, the tax now uh, uh, is basically uh, ma ma mainly on the uh, on the uh, uh, prime contractor, which is the main contractor, the general contractor, that's basically what it is for, and and uh, it's it, meaning it's paid up front. But this prime contractor generally sometimes would sub these these uh, contracts out to subcontractors, which is this is really what what this is for. Is basically some of these subcontractors don't have, uh, or even the prime contractors don't have a uh, uh, contractor's license number. And this, this basically is going to uh, fix, and I, I'm thinking maybe with the, our, our people that are here, uh, maybe they can speak to that and, and see if, if this, uh, basically it, it's going to be generally a service license when they go to the Department of Revenue and Taxation. It's going to be a service license number that they'll be getting, and, and that will be the, the, uh, the uh, number that they'll be putting on the, uh, on the exemption. Thank you very much, John, for that explanation. And uh, Mr. Chairman, if you recall the uh, public hearing on this particular legislation, there was a particular contractor that came forward and uh, made a statement that rightfully so, because John, from your perspective, however your agency interprets the law, then you obviously need to carry it out. But there was a story during the course of the public hearing where, in fact, the contractor had stepped in and said, that revenue tax now is interpreting the law in this fashion so that all the subcontractors now would have to pay GRTs on the primary contract. So they were asking if by any chance, by virtue of identifying the prime contractor and falling under the guise of the prime contractor, that this would allow now that they no longer will be required to pay GRTs on that particular contract itself. So. Uh, just to share with you, because like I said, I mean, if revenue tax, you're going aggressively after uh, some collection of taxes, rightfully so, but the contractors, or the contractor that provided testimony during the hearing was primarily concerned about that, and incidentally, right after that testimony, there were other uh, conversations that I participated in where it's also affected additional contractors, and this is only this is being brought up now because of the impending military buildup, because of all the potential for federal contracts, and these subcontractors certainly want to make sure that at least they're in the best position to be able to submit a proposal and to participate and to support some of these, these contracts without having to insert that additional GRT obligation, potential obligation. So just, just as to share a little bit of perspective in terms of why this legislation has been put forward. And the chairman explained it extremely well in terms of uh, making sure that the prime contractor owns that obligation for the GRT and not necessarily incur uh, extend that 
to the subcontractors. But uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, if, if we can hear from the uh, Chairman of the Gong Contractors Association, I believe he also may be able to share some insight. Thank you. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, that on. Okay, I don't want to blow anybody's ears. Uh, I believe that everybody that's doing business uh, with or has a military contract is required to have, at the very least, a Guam business license. Um, there is a federal regulation that uh, doesn't mandate or, or exempts contractors if they work exclusively on the base from not having a contractor's license. You know, if I had my choice, I would require that they have a contractor's license, but apparently a federal law trumps local law, and therefore, you know, we got to live by that. But what this uh, bill also does is it gives a check and balance to uh, Department of Revenue and Tax uh, because if a subcontractor were to put in uh, a claim that, you know, they work for a prime contractor who doesn't have a contractor's license or is not an architect or engineer and therefore don't have a registration number or a certificate of authority from the appeals board can now use a Guam business license. If they don't have that, that should be a red flag for Revenue Tax and say, oh, wait a minute, ABC company here is claiming that they're going to get a tax exemption from XYZ company, who's the prime, but we have no record of XYZ. So that would be an indication that, a good indication that that company is probably not paying uh, local taxes here on Guam because they don't even have a contractor's license, they don't have a, a certificate of authority or a PO's registration number. And now, with this new law, they don't have a uh, business Guam business license uh, for for service, so it gives a check and balance there. Um, and there's a reason why we wanted this law changed, just to get clarity that um, even if they don't have a contractor's license or a or a registration number, uh, there is a number that they can uh, make reference to for that particular taxpayer. And I'm assuming that because they're a federal contractor that they're paying taxes. I don't know. You know, Mr. Camacho would probably want to know, but I don't know if they, if they are or not. But it's a good way to do that check and balance when a subcontractor comes and files their taxes with that registration number or that contractor's license number or now with that Guam business license. And so if those checks aren't there, none of them match or there's no record of any of that, then that should be a red flag for Reverend Tax to say, well, wait a minute, this company, you know, we have no record of this company and... Like I said, chances are they're probably not paying the 4% gross receipts tax. But I think they are required, John, if, if I'm not mistaken, that they have to pay uh, the gross receipts tax yes. uh, as a federal contractor because that's yes. one of the uh, specs that they say they have to be um, they have to be licensed to business on Guam. But they weren't specific to say they had to have a contractor's license because there's another federal law or whatever that allows them or that exempts them from requiring a, uh, a state-issued uh, contractor's license. And likewise, our local contractors here can actually get a contract in the states, work exclusively on a military base, and not be required to have a, you know, let's say a California contractor's license. Uh, but they do have to still register their company with the state of California for some kind of a business license or, or some kind of instrument to allow them to do business there. Keep in mind that the the the, the law uh, the law has changed now from from a person that that actually does the services in the past, and now it, it's really the prime contractor that actually pays for the entire GRT, even if the prime contractor doesn't provide the services. So that's, that's the, the whole thing right now is that, that uh, given a case, let's say a $10 million contract is, is, is awarded to the prime contractor and the, the prime contractor generally uh, subcontract sub some of these uh, projects out to some of the contractors that actually um, uh, are, are, are on Guam. So basically, the prime contractor will pay the 4% of the 10 million 
not maybe in one month, but throughout the, the times that, that the amounts were received for, for any particular months. But at the same time, um, when they received these uh, funds, they would have to pay the SOP that actually did the, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the services. So when the, the SOP actually um, uh, reports it on the return, it has to have a number. And if the prime contractor, even a SOP to SOP, because even if it goes down layer to layer, in other words, if the SOP also SOPs it to another person, another subcontractor, then everybody must have a number in order for it not to be actually taxed twice. So that's one of the reasons why um, when someone doesn't have a, a number, a contractor's license number, our staff are, 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 are looking at these things and say, this, the law is very specific. It says contractor's license number. And if you don't have a contractor's license number, then it's not part of the exemption. So this basically would basically would say that now the equal paying fee of all the contractors now can get you know uh, uh, you know the fair equal treatment of these things. Otherwise, if the person that's reporting it doesn't have the person's contractor's license number, then they would have to pay the the, the four percent again. And then I think that's what's happening. Now, you described in um, your earlier testimony, John, that the business license will actually be a service business license? It, it, generally, generally, because, because uh, uh, this, there's a ruling way back that's from the AG that basically says that if a contractor is specifically <coughs> providing service in federal territory, federal grounds, then they don't have to get a contractor's license. Uh, no, uh, they don't have to be subject to the, the Guam contractor's license board, in other words. So they don't get a license from the board, uh, in other words. So this alternative is saying they still need to go and register with the Department of Revenue and Taxation. So I believe the, on, the, the, the only other, the license that they would probably be seeking is a service license. My, my concern, though, is that the way the law is written is that even with this amendment, for the Guam business license number, it's supposed to only be, the, the deduction's only supposed to be able to ap apply specifically to a taxpayer who is a contractor. But if right. the business license has them licensed as a, a service, how do we reconcile that they're actually a contractor? And that's that's something that, uh, you know, uh, we, we know that they are really a, a contractor because they're U.S. contractors, just that they're they're not, by law, govern, governed by the, the uh, contractor's license board. But like what, if, what if, for example, they were to get a Guam business license uh, as, a, as a service, you know, a service business license under a different, a different mm -hmm. name, for example? Mm -hmm. Because um, in, in, their, in their payment arrangements of the federal government, they'll be contracted to federal government. And I understand that NAVFAC does require a business license number, but what if the business license number and name don't reconcile with the actual contractor on record with, uh, with um, DOD? Well, and then, and well, then when they're, these they're guys file for their exemption and the name's different on the service license, how do we even reconcile yeah. that with saying, oh, well, this contractor is supposed to have been the one that paid that GRT? How do we, how do we follow the dollar the, back to its, the, its source? The, the license would actually show the construction name. In other words, when, when, when you're a contractor, you go to business license and you register your corporation, so your business with the Department of Revenue and Taxation, then when, when the, the uh, license is issued, it's going to say, for example, ABC Construction Company, and it's going to show a, a service license. Uh, and the only one, the only, and they're doing that now. That's this, they've been doing it, you know, for when they actually come in. So, the the original law that was passed only allowed the the exemption for for licenses that are issued by the contractors license board. But in this particular event, uh, businesses, constructions that are normally doing, I mean, generally only doing businesses on on federal grounds, are not. Are not you know if if they step out uh, step out of the military grounds then they need to get a contractor's license board, from my understanding. But if they only, for example, they're only doing construction work, let's say up at at, at the Andes Air Force Base, then they're not required to to uh, get a contractor's license or be governed by the contractor's license uh, here in Guam. So, so we the only alternative that I believe. Uh, they, they came up with this alternative. They probably have other alternatives, but one of the terms they came up, I believe, from your, your side is the license number. 
and that's now, but, something. But, so, so what you're saying is that for our Guam business licenses, we do not have a contractor's business license, except for those that are issued through the Guam Contractors License Board. Yes, I mean, in other words, we don't issue uh, license for, for contractors on Guam. Only the Contractors License Board issues the license by the way so we, we don't even issue those license it's 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 only issued by the by the board so um, and and the original law only says that if you get a license and and uh, um, uh, and you want to get an exemption then you need to disclose that constructions uh, constructions name down and the li construction license number or, or if it if it applies to the architects and all these things which are governed by the boards so um, it, the only alternative for these people that don't have these numbers is to basically work at a, on an alternative. So my concern is if we, if we look at bill, the, on, the, on the bill, mm -hmm. page 2, line 16 to 17, mm -hmm. the, the exemption o applies only to the deductible gross income of the taxpayer who is a contractor. Now, I understand that, of course, it's a contractor. They've got the contract that's doing the work on the base. But for all intents and purposes, the taxpayer on Guam for GRT would only be whoever filed for that service business license. And so I still feel like we have a disconnect between um, does our 4% GRT um, apply to a contractor if that contractor is only being licensed to do business um, with a service business license and isn't defined as a contractor uh, in the business licensing process? Sure, if you can, anytime. You know, there, there is a disconnect, and the, the disconnect is, is the word contractor. Um, in all the discussions we've had, the contractor is synonymous with construction. But a contractor is a contractor, a subcontractor is a subcontractor. Could be construction, could be services. For our company, we have both licenses. We have a business license for services on Guam through the, through the um, um, revenue tax. We also have a contractor's license through the, the contracting board. Now, the example that we have is that our company was subcontracted by a local prime contractor for a DOD project. But the work we did was the acquisition, was to manage the acquisition of supplies from Japan to Guam. That was in construction but that was services. And so what happened to us was that although the, the prime contract was a construction contract, our part was services, and we were told that we had to pay GRT. Okay? So, so the, the, the disconnect is that word contractor. We need to define that as either a construction contractor or, or a services contractor. But the way we read the law, it didn't matter. If a prime contractor is paying GRT, then the subcontractor, whether they're construction or services, shouldn't have to pay the GRT. Our experience is not the same. It's not, it, it doesn't fall on. We had to pay GRT. Well, we decided, we chose to pay GRT because we want to sleep at night. You know, we're a small company. But that's where the, the some of the disconnect, I think, is, is that word contractor. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, you're, you're talking about now the, uh, the other side of the equation now on, on, the, on the same subject, but I, I very much agree with you that um, we, we, we want to make sure, in the end, look, this is, the, this is all we're trying to do. We want to make sure that when a, big, uh, when a prime, whether it's service or construction, when a prime gets a contract and the prime pays a GRT on that contract, we're not having anybody else that they subcontract relative to that, to that same business arrangement paying GRT all over again. And so that's that, that's the intent of the bill, um, but but there there may be, and that's why we're having this roundtable. There may be language uh, issues that we might want to uh, um, further tweak before we, we we pass this and say that we solve the problem. Because I, I I see where you're coming from also on the service side, you know. Because then we have to kind of back up and we have to look here. Because if you're looking at um, trying to figure out whether it's some um, construction or service, all it says is contractor. But it says contractor as defined in subsection 2B101B on line 14 of page 2 of the bill. So we need to really, uh, I think, uh, pull up um, subsection 26101B and uh, come to a determination on that. But John, so um, how, how, is the, how is the agency applying it? Is it just to the construction contracts or is it also to the service contracts? Because there are very large... Uh, service contracts up at uh, From up my at discussion the with my staff, we, we, we interpret 
interpret that if there's no, generally there's no contractor's license number or any of these, these uh, uh, exemptions, uh, professional engineers, architect, land surveyor, or certificate of authorization from the, from the business authorized to do engineering and all these things, uh, we don't allow the exemptions. So, um, you know, you, you know, if, if you want to look at this, and and um, when you say you're on the exemption, it says issued by the Guam Contractors License Board or the Guam Business License Number of the contractor, of a contractor, meaning you already recognize that this is a contractor. Uh, maybe something that you might want to consider identifying that this service is really a, a, a contractor or, or uh, I think that was your concern on, 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 on the, uh, the service because um, you know any, any license there's multiple services that are issued for, for different licenses so your concern is that on this license this, uh, this license number uh, it could mean any license number but if you're concerned by adding the word of a contractor, I guess uh, maybe it's something that if if you're concerned about about the uh, the the, uh, the word uh, Guam business license number, if if that's something that you you guys want to consider. Well, we can add the language of a contractor, but then it, the, it begs the question: Does that language also suffice to address service contracts and construction contracts? or is it just construction contracts? And if it's just construction contracts, then why are we making the business license be a service business license that we're going to allow for the exemption? See, there's, there's, it's just not, uh, it's not fitting. If, if it's only going to be for uh, um, construction or engineering or, 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 or things you listed earlier, but they're gonna be getting a service business license. I'm very concerned that we, we just may be opening it up where if it's just that business license and it's a service business license, um, are we or are we not going to actually be, you know, recognizing the exemptions in a uniform way, you know? So maybe we need to, uh, maybe we need to be a, a lot more specific on how we define it. I mean, I mean, I, I know the, the, the definition of, of contractor because we're, we're really, Talking about a section that talks about tax on contractors, so so um, I, I know we don't govern govern the the uh, contractors license board. Uh, maybe that's something that may be brought up to the contractor license board on, on this particular issue on, on what what is their their uh, uh, definitions on these things because because it, it's very broad when you read the, the definition of contractor on the, the B, on the BPT law. Mm -hmm. If you go into that section, well, um, James, on the on the from the contractor's license board, um, if you're familiar, if you could shed some light, um, are they just construction contractors or are they also service contractors? There's maintenance contractors. Could you? That also I'm sorry. Could you? Also There's also contractors who do maintenance work that have a contractor's license, and then there's other um, classifications that where they do. Uh, home improvement type, not necessarily a big construction project, but it's all tied into construction. Pest control is construction. Pest, pest control, yeah. It's not service. But it's a... Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have a business license. Yeah. Contractor's license. They, have they have one for contractor's license, yeah. We have yeah. one contractor's license and we do, yeah. Yeah, we don't have a uh, Guam business license. We have a Guam contractor's license and we just do <coughs> pest control. Uh, we don't pick up a shovel or jackhammer through a wall when we're listed under a contractor. Okay. The, the other conversation I wanted to have about all this, John, is because I, as, we're, as we're evaluating this, right, I kind of look at this on the service side at how we're trying to avoid double taxation on the service side. And then when I, when I, when I flip over the coin and I look at the retail side, I see it almost like in reverse where we have no GRT for the wholesale distribution businesses, but we have it for the retail. So that's almost like having no GRT on the prime and GRT on the sub. And so here we're having a conversation now about, we'll take it away from the subs and only have it apply to the primes, but, how, but on the flip side of the retail, it's, it's, it's different. And so I'm just trying to, I, I wanted to kind of have a dialogue about that because from, from my angle, I'm just trying to look at it consistently in terms of, of, of how the taxation should flow. 
And in this conversation, we're saying top down, someone pays it up front, nobody should pay it on the, on the, um, on the, uh, on the, on the downstream. But this is for service, and this is for, well, first we're talking about contractors, but now we're bringing it up for service. But then on the, on the retail side, it's, it's reverse, where it's the upstream that gets taxed. Uh, please state your name for the record. Sorry, Jacob Leon Grow. I'm uh, with Smithbridge. Um, my grasp on that question is, when you look at it, a retailer sells to the end customer, right? And a prime contractor, again, sells to the end customer versus the other way around. So that's the only thing. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. And, and also, the, the, the intent of this law that, that reverses the, the taxing is they, they want to capture the, the funds right up, right, up, right up front. In other words, rather than giving it down to, to all the SOC, you know, now it's captured up front fast, in other words. In other words, you, you don't distribute it to the, to the uh, SOC. It used to be before that the SOC would be the one to take care of their, their uh, tax, but now uh, at the late former uh, Senator uh, Ben, ben Pangelina and he says, why don't we capture it up front? And that's why they, they changed it. So now it, 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 it requires some of the prime contractors is to say, hey, the minute you get those funds, you have to pay GRT 4% upfront right there. And also one of the challenges that, that the community was having and also Reverend Tax at that point in time mm -hmm. is the prime contractor, we were not capturing their taxes, the GRTs, but a lot of the prime contractors, because of some of the military bureau related activities and some of the federal contracts, apparently they benefited from that process and they did not pay local GRT. So, so that's why Speaker Ben said, why don't we look at getting the prime contract to own that obligation so that in fact the subprimes, which we presume would all originate from Guam or Guam business licenses would also benefit. So you're absolutely right. And, yes. and I just want to share and, that perspective. And, and the also the, the old law was a little bit complicated because we were having subcontractors come up and, and say, you know, if, if it, some, somehow the, the way they're doing their, their, their keeping is that sometimes, uh, uh, because if they become a sub to a sub, there's a lot of where you report the income and not have to report the income. In, in other words, because you, 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 you do, and sometimes they come up with a negative in, in, in a month. And they, some of the, the, the companies or CPA firms are, come to our office and gave us some samples of those things and you know record keeping is, is at that point was a nightmare so it, it's really good that they capture everything up front now the, uh, the other side of the of, of the equation too on, on the um, capturing it on the primes I see how that I, I see that how, how that makes sense but my other concern now is we have had some contractors um, that did not pay GRT that we've had to take action against um, with the agency. And my concern is um, particularly with these off-island contractors getting large contracts on the military bases, do we have the adequate um, resources and, and procedures in place to be able to um, pursue due process uh, in the event that we, we, we find a situation where uh, a prime wasn't paying and they're an off-island prime? Yes, we do. We, we have a, a task force, which is the Military Bureau Task Force that, that we we, we, we had you know way back and uh, we do monitor these these companies that are being uh, being awarded uh, these contracts and uh, one of the thing that makes it better even now is that uh, in every contract I believe there's a provision in the contract and correct me if I'm wrong with some of you is there's a provision in the contract that you are as a contractor liable for all these taxes that are, are imposed in Guam so We've seen a lot of people uh, throughout the years that m a lot of them comply, but there's still some of them that don't comply. And, and we, we do, we do uh, identify those ones that don't comply. And, and at the same time, uh, we communicate with them and we, we, make, we make sure that uh, we do follow-ups and basically we do uh, get some of those monies in, into Guam. So we, we, we found a lot already. So, so to clarify, um, we don't want to be doing double taxation. We want to make sure that it's um, consistently applied to all prime contracts, not just <clears throat> not just construction, but service as well. Um, do we have the mechanisms in place with this bill to be able to to ensure that, or do we need to somehow rework the language in a way where we're able to identify through the business license who is a prime and who is a sub? 
um, in service or in construction. I, again, this bill, I, I believe, is mainly to, to um, uh, address those contractors that are doing construction business on Guam that don't have a licensed contractor's number. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, one of the things that, uh, because it, 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 it doesn't give a, an equal playing field out there where somebody has to uh, pay the tax twice if the tax has already been paid, which means that if you're a SOP and, and, uh, and, and uh, the, the prime contractor, the contractor before you doesn't have a contractor's license number, then you're it. And you, 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 there's no exemptions. Then you would have to pay double tax in which the prime or the SOP before you <coughs> may have already paid the tax. So I think this is this is the reason why. I mean, my 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 point is that we've been addressing this with 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 the contractors license board. They have addressed it to us, also the Chamber of Commerce, and 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 said, you know, the only way that we can resolve this is basically to address the issue by law. And and I think this is one of the issues that that uh, I did not come up with this. This was a proposed uh, issue to to uh, take care of those construction companies that cannot get a contractor's license number. Uh, and I think this is where the disconnect is, is because, again, we're using the word contractor. When, If you get a contract from the federal government, from their perspective, you're a contractor, maybe not a construction contractor. And we keep going back to construction, and I think, uh, Senator San Nicholas, you had the right comment about construction and service contracts and we're because I believe and please correct me if I'm wrong the intent is is that we don't have double taxation on these federal funds coming in for these military build-up contracts or whatever federal contracts are coming in and that applies to the guys providing service and the guys digging the holes you know right and putting up the buildings and I and I think you're rightfully um, determining that that this one line doesn't do that because what will happen is we'll be in the same place we are today with revenue tax interpreting it and saying well you're not con this wasn't construction you swept the floors right or or you you provided logistics and and then getting and and then we're having this thing where you're still getting charged for it so I I think you you've made the right determination in saying the wording, we've got to come up with some wording that really meets the complete intent. And there's going to have to be a lot of thought, because even as I'm sitting here and we've talked about in the past, we can't come up with wording. I mean, I, I guess we can, but it's going to take, it, it, take a lot more effort, because the way it gets implemented at Revenue Tax is they say, oh, it's construction, sorry. Well, DZSP, who's got the biggest contract on Guam, is giving out contracts for all kinds of stuff, not just construction. So is the intent that they pay GRT, and, and maybe that's a bad example, because they're... It's a great example. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So, but, it, you know, is the intent that, that, that every person that works for DSP is paying 4%, and then even, because if they were to give an award to Black, let's say DSP hired Black to do a, a job, and then, and then Black gave him a word to Al to help them with the materials. Then all of a sudden you've got him paying 4%, Black paying 4%, and then this DZSP, right? So, so I, I, I think you're right that you, we really need to go through the wording because otherwise we're going to be right back where we are with revenue tax, and rightfully so because it's not, it's not really hard to find. You keep going back to the word contractor. Right. right. Part of, part of that issue, part of the, that concern also is, <clears throat> is is that the question is, do the taxes trigger on the business license or on the contracting board license number? Well, right now okay? the way it's written is, is it would be the contractor board license number. Right, right. And so, and so, so, so here, here's the problem. Not every company on Guam has to go to the contracting, the license board. Right. Uh, and so whenever we're talking, we're always going back to the licensing board, which takes it back to construction. Um, and that's, that's where part of the confusion comes in. Right. Um, 
and absolutely good good example with DGSP 21. Yeah. You know, they've got a prime contract that they're being paid for by the government. They subcontract to me for services, and they're saying, well, you know, you don't have a contractor's license number, so, you know, you have to pay your own taxes. You have right. to pay your own GRT. Right. And, and, you know, is that right? Is that what we intended to do? I don't think so. You know, we look at the definition of contractor on the based on the current uh, GCA section 26.01.1b. It says the contractor shall include shall include every person engaging in the business of contracting to erect, construct, repair, or improve any insulation of any kind or description, or to provide under contract any service or material for the erection, construction, repair, or improvement of any insulation. So all those are kind of construction related. But as you read further, it says, or to provide under contract labor to any, oh, labor to another for any purpose or use whatsoever, which shall not include the personal services contract of an individual. So that's a little different than construction. Basically what we're talking about is when a house does logistics, they're providing labor to another for purpose for, for another purpose, which is logistics. So they're in the definition they fall within the definition that's on the that's on the law. Yeah. In the laws of this. Yeah. No, no, sorry. Um, uh, and so and so um, the first time we saw this law was two thousand eleven, I think it was April of two thousand eleven it came out. And, and my concern is, is maybe it's cultural now. Uh, because back then, in 2011, uh, everyone was saying, no, it's only, it's only construction, not services. If you're doing services, you have to pay GRT. Because this thing only covered construction. And they had a, a real nice graph uh, and a di diagram where they showed a prime contractor, a construction prime contractor, subcontracting to, to construction subcontractors, right? And they said, this is how it works. A sub construction subcontractor will not have to pay GRT. What they didn't show was, what if there was a services contractor? They didn't show that. And so from 2011 until today, my concern is that the culture now is, and, and the understanding or the belief is that, is that service contractors still have to pay their taxes, regardless of whether they're under a contract. Uh, you know, as a prime contractor, yes, we pay our taxes, absolutely. But as a subcontractor, was the intent always to have us pay our taxes or what, to have the prime pay the, the taxes? And I, I think it was the latter. So um, that's our concern. It's a cultural thing, almost. almost. It's probably one of those things that were just established and constantly followed yeah, and yeah. probably needs to be reviewed. John, in, 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 in light of that law that was just clarified, um, does your position as director change with respect to um, how, if you can, if you can know. We always follow the definition of, of a, a contractor, and, I, and I, I said earlier it's very broad. So I, I didn't say any any that we're not allowing it or not. But basically, I, I think the key word here is is uh, uh, when when you're you're giving the exemptions, you know, it's very limited right now. The law only limits to certain groups, which is you gotta have a contractor's license number, you gotta be a, a, an architect, an engine, professional engineer, professional uh, architect professional land surveyor or a certificate, a CO8 number for a business authorized under the engineering. So and so those are the only ones that are basically limited for exemptions. So if, 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 if none of these people don't have this, like what we're doing now, which is the big ones also is, is the ones that are coming from, from, from outside, they don't, they don't have uh, any of these things, then you, know, you, you, you need to pay the tax. And even if it even if it's basically going to have a double taxation, and that's basically you know we're just following the law. And, and that's so if we were to, because I'm trying to get language here to, to satisfy the dialogue. So after the after the word Guam business license number on page two line twenty, if we were to add the words of a contractor as defined in subsection twenty six one zero one b, would that then apply to all the ser all the services? I, I, I got to go back and basically, you know, look at it. I, I, I cannot okay. right now make a decision. Okay, so he, here's what we'll do, and, and I, I very much appreciate the dialogue, and I appreciate Senator Uggen um, helping us to get to this point, because I understand that this was his primary intent, you know, to eliminate the double taxation. So what we'll do is um, I'll, um, my office will work with you, John, to, to um, try and tighten up the language to a point where 
um, this objective of avoiding the double taxation based on the existing contractor definition of the law is is going to satisfy um, the intent of Senator Uggen with respect to this bill. Okay, because, uh, and again, uh, Senator Uggen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what you want is um, to eliminate any double taxation on any contractors as defined in subsection 26101B. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. So, um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add to the conversation? Yes. Okay, please, everybody, anytime. Ma'am, you first. Okay. Thank you. I would also like to be able to have a section that says, for those of us that were told by revenue and tax, that we cannot take the exemption anymore, be grandfathered in, and be given credit for what we have already paid for as a form of a double taxation. So even though um, the interpretation of the law as we see it is different from revenue and tax, like Mr. Yanger said, we continue to pay our taxes. So if we can be grandfathered in and be given credit for those period of time in which we have in paying these taxes. What I'm observing, uh, man, is that the way that the way the law is written is that it only applies to contractors who have a contractor's license number, and that contractor's license number is only that which is issued by the Guam Contractors License Board. By and so, the contractor, you mean? I'm, I, I'm, no, the, only, the the way that the the way the law is written, but Senator Ogden is amending existing law. So before we amend the existing law, the existing law only allows for exemptions for contractors who are licensed under the Guam Contractors License Board. And so Revan Tax should have only been honoring exemptions to those companies that were filing for those exemptions using those Guam Contractors License Board numbers. Now what this bill will do is it will further extend it to the broad definition of any contractor who has a Guam business license. Um, based on the, on the conversation we're having here about including some of the additional language. So I don't think that there would be any pre-existing liability on behalf of the government, but what this bill would do is going forward, um, you would be able to claim an exemption uh, based on the, just the definition of contractor. But prior to this bill, and until we change the law, there is no exemption for any business license um, contractor arrangements. It has to be contractor's license board only. So. Um, you wouldn't need to be grandfathered in. Once the law changes, it would apply to you. But I don't think that there's a case for uh, um, crediting it back because I don't think that there was any erroneous taxation. It was just to the strict definition of the law. But if the prime contractor paid the taxes, and then I'm being uh, asked to pay for the taxes too, which I have done, so that's a double taxation. Right, and and and, it, and and that that would be unfair, but it was it was not uh, it was not disallowed under law, and so what we're going to do now, if Senator Uggen's bill is disallow that under law, so the previous double taxations um, were not illegal, they were they were uh, a loophole in the law that's going to be corrected with Senator Uggen's bill. In, in, in other words, the the, exem the exemptions were only granted for this for, for this particular purpose, right. and and. That's what we follow. I mean, if, if I mean, we've been telling these: if you don't have a contractor's license number, which is the law, then or any of these things, then um, you cannot take the exemptions. That's that's what we basically we're saying. So the the, the bad news is, there, we, I don't think we can put any kind of credit in there. The good news is, with Senator Uggen's um, diligence, um, I think that you'll be able to get the exemption going forward. And how long do we have to wait for this? As soon as we're able, well, the reason why we're having the round, well, Senator Uggen's already introduced the bill, the reason we're having the round table is to have this dialogue so we can make sure we, the language accomplishes what it's intended. If we didn't have this round table, we probably would still have that, that circumstance outstanding. So now that we're having this round table, we're gonna tighten up the language and then we're gonna be able to move it out of committee and onto the floor for a vote. But we first need to make sure that everything's, uh, everything's squared away. Sorry. And basically, uh, we are basically a contractor. Contractor as in uh, we construct. So as far as our side is concerned, the operative word for us here, which was an improvement from the previous law, was the either in line, line 18 and the addition of the Guam business license. This one works good for us. Okay, because we are, quote unquote, a victim of that mainland base only inside the fence contractor. However, on the issue of the service provider, there is such a thing as 
construction related service provider you might want to add that in the language so that to distinguish the language of service for what is it service to the tourist industry or service to the construction because as the example says of DCSP DCSP will sublet not just construction itself but including services it could be logistic it could be simple as water blasting whatever but in the language of construction that is all falls under the not to complicate the language construction related service providers so if the service you're providing is nothing related to construction then i believe if it is in the tourist there should be tax in that and, and, and you do bring up a very good point on the slippery slope that we need to be very careful about here because if our intent is just to make sure that the prime contractors are paying the tax and it's not filtering down to subcontractors what we don't want to do is create a situation either where somebody sells a tour package and all of a sudden every single person who's providing a tour service within that package no longer has to pay any GRT you know that could have um, uh, incredible ramifications to revenue so that that, that is a very a, a very good point and, then, um, and it looks like we have a lot more to really consider with respect to the language of the bill. Um, Senator, excuse me, sure. but I disagree completely. And here's why. If you define that as construction-related services only, then what about my prime contract where I'm developing software for GovGuam and I hire a subcontractor? That's not construction. That's a service. No, I, I very much agree with you, sir. I don't, I don't believe that... Um, I, I'm not agreeing with the language that he's proposing. I am agreeing that we just want to make sure that as we protect against the double taxation to prime con um, from prime to sub, that we're not also going to be op um, having the language too open-ended where people can be misinterpreting it and misapplying it at revenue tax to perhaps like a tour package being sold sure, sure. and, and all and ancillary why, yeah. services falling under an umbrella and, all, and no taxes being paid. Absolutely, and that's why I go back so, to the first point. Right. Part of the confusion is that we're contractor because the contractor in this discussion has always been synonymous with construction, nothing else. And so we need to break away from that and either define it further as construction and services or just say all contracts. But if we keep throwing construction in there and we keep throwing the contractor's license in there, oh, it's no, always going to go back to construction. I, I want to assure you, at least in my mind, with respect to this roundtable, that train's already left the station. Yeah, We're not going to be limiting it um, specifically only to construction. But what we do want to just make sure of is as we begin to explore this double taxation problem of between primes to subs, that we're not going to um, slip slip in the, way, in the language of the law in a way that's going to create um, the greater hazard, which I think is what you were speaking to which is um, uh, other entities I misinterpreting and misapplying the, the intent of the law to bypass GRT on a whole different range of industries. Right. You know, we, we say we, we're representing the Small Business Committee at the Chamber of Commerce, and our constituents there are everyone. Construction, non-construction, services, whatever, right? And so we just want this law to cover everyone. I believe that that, like the, the chairman said, that train already left the station. I mean, we want to make sure that, in fact, we close the loop and we recognize the service industry, but that it's applicable to a prime contract, you know, not necessarily future out to, to the rest of the community where, in fact, everyone now is eligible for uh, exemption from GRT rather than the intent of this particular legislation, which is to go and, and make sure that that obligation is incurred by the prime contractor and the subprimes, regardless as to whether they're services or construction, that they don't necessarily have to pay GRTs. And I'm very appreciative that Reverend Tax is, is represented here because their insight is exactly what we need at the table. And, and if I could just add, I, I think having this, when you talked about retail and having it at the prime level, is the appropriate place uh, also because the, those are the bigger numbers, right? If you were to say, okay, we'll make the wholesalers pay and not the retailer, well, the wholesaler's number is smaller than the retailer's num sales number, right? What he's charging the retailer is the lowest amount, and then the retailer is marking it up based on his overhead and his profits. So capturing it at that point where you're selling to the end user, like we're talking about, is the... I, for me as a Guam resident, is the appropriate place because that's the high, 4% of that number is higher than 4% of the wholesale or the subcontractor's number. 
you, we want to take as a community that four percent of the that sale to the end the end user. So whoever's making that sale, that's what we want. To, number one, it's easier because it's fewer points, and then number two, it's the bigger number. So, sorry, there's a big difference between contracts and uh, retail. That's why, in my view, the const in construction, yeah, the, const the, the tax should be on the prime. Okay? Great. Great. Why? Because there is no other value added as it triples down to the, to the subcontractor. The contract is 100 million. When it goes to the subcontractor divided by so many subcontractors, it's still 100 million. Great. But if it is in a retail, the, from the, for the, ad, it, the, what's this? No, the, no, actually, the, from the, whole, I, from I the wholesale to the, the retail, they will start to add their markup, they will have their payroll, they have the, so at the end of the day, the value of the product that came to the customer is already not equivalent to the wholesale because there are value expenses. That's why the taxes there is on that grassroots level. So there should not be a comparison between wholesale retail to the construction subcontractor dimension. There should not be. It's totally different. It is, it is a different business. Uh, it's not I, a business. I, it's the how the, pro, how the money works, how the money moves. Navy, no, I, I understand. Yeah, Navy gives 100, one dollar project. No matter how the main contractor distribute that, it's still one dollar because can, that's can, what's going to be given by the navy or the federal. But for a wholesale, if I get something and I distribute it to the consumer, as it triples uh, ripples down the line, there are added costs that at the end of the line. That one is no longer equivalent to the wholesale because expenses, no. profit are. Well, no. Okay, so if I can respond, they are different businesses. Um, but a prime contract that goes out to a, I mean, a federal contract that goes out to a prime contractor does not that total amount does not equal the sum of all the subs. I'm sorry, because the prime is in it to make money as well. And I think we can agree on yeah, that. Yeah, we can agree on that. Right, so the they prime... They will even suffer Can, I, can I respond? So the prime is in it to make money as well, and they do have hours in it in addition to their profit. So they have their overhead uh, amounts, they have the work they're putting into it, and then they have their profit. So if they got $100 million, they didn't have $100 million in subcontracts. I guarantee it because why are they in business right and it's and so the basic business model everybody's making money along the way and really the comparison I'm not saying they're the same business but the comparison is who's selling to the end user right who or the end customer that's the comparison right we all have an end customer we all have somebody using the product whether the product is a building, whether the product is a service, we all have somebody using the product. So who's making that sale? And there are issues, I don't disagree, there are issues with, because with, we want to look at the unintended consequences, uh, right? Because even if I'm thinking about this, am I going to have the Hilton coming and saying, well, as this hotel room, right, was sold to DZSP or whoever, right? I mean, there are issues like that that we need to consider. And so I'm not disagreeing, but, but I am disagreeing with the overall statement that, those are, you know, and we all have an end customer. That's so, my, that was my point. Right. No, and, and I really appreciate the dialogue um, about the, the greater question of tax policy, which is ultimately, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, but it, um, um, pulling it back to um, the, um, the bill, this is specific to double taxation. 
And so um, we're going to definitely uh, explore how we can tighten the language to make sure that for contractors as defined in subsection 26101B, we're going to make sure that the, ca the tax is captured at the prime level and is not um, double taxed down to the sub-level, uh, whether it's construction or service provided, that it all falls in line with the definition of contractor in subsection 26101B. We're going to look closely at the definition so that this law will apply to a very narrow scope of uh, relationships between primes and subs so that it doesn't get um, taken out of context and blown out of proportion where everyone all of a sudden starts considering themselves a master seller to a sub seller. Um, that needs to be very, very clear. So um, I'll work with Senator Uggen and, and the rest of my colleagues and definitely with um, Revan Tax and we'll make sure that um, the objective of, of um, taking away the problem of double taxation that is intended with this bill will be accomplished, um, but only in the narrow scope of the relationships between prime contractors and subcontractors. Okay, and, we'll, and then we'll move forward from there. Is everybody, uh, is everybody okay, John? Uh, yes, I just want to comment because I, I believe there's a lot of talk here about contractor and service. I, I you know, I, I just reading the, the uh, part of the gross receipt addresses what is a tax on contractors and what are tax on service. So if I want to read a section on, on the law that says tax on service is basically 4%. So it, it's very important that you categorize what these entities are or, or characteristics that we're, we're looking at because every person out there that is in service would have to pay 4%, whether they're in a repair shop or, or uh, doing other services, they have to pay 4%. So that's the reason why when they say tax on contractors, you know, then they have all these, these uh, uh, definition of what a contractor is because there is a definition of what service is if you're a service. So people that got a, a service license are basically paying 4% of their business. So that's something that we need to look at and, and, and make the, the distinguish of you know, what is service and what is the contractor. Right, and, and the reason why this, this, this whole conversation um, um, came out and um, helped to really define the problem is when you specifically explain that the um, off-island contractors are getting a service business license. You know, so it, it creates that whole um, open, we, we need to tighten it. And so we'll, we'll work together to tighten it. That, uh, if you can tighten it on the mic, John. I didn't come up with that language. Right. I just said that, you know, there, there is a problem uh, with, with, with uh, you know, among contractors that these people that are, are don't have these contractors license board are being taxed twice. That's what I basically say. And, and we're just following the law. And, and uh, the only way that, uh, you know, this thing is going to be resolved is there's going to be language for a, a, a substitute of a contractor's license number. That's what's basically what we're, we're, we're saying. But when we start getting into service and all these things, there is a definition of what, you know, a bit uh, taxation on, on services and on, on the BPT law. So I just wanted to make sure that when we move forward on these things, we need to really define you know, what the languages are, uh, contractors versus businesses on services. Senator, May, one last comment for myself. And, and that, that is, I don't know if this is the right place or this bill is the right place to address it, but if we don't talk about enforcement, what you're going to see out there is what's been going on, and that is the prime contractors are going to push the taxes down to the subcontractors, whether we like it or not. So in the confusion of the last five years, I have owned a Guam contractor contracting license certificate okay Bis aside from my business license and because of the confusion we have paid all our taxes regardless of whether we're prime or sub because like I said we want to sleep at good at night and so um, and so I hope that this will address also enforcement on the prime contractor side uh, just to just to mitigate that that potential right well, I, I, and that's why I'm very grateful for, for John being here, yeah. because in the course of these roundtables, um, as new information becomes available and we're able to spot problems, um, the, most the, 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 the most efficient way for us to address it is to first look at what we're already doing and whether or not the existing laws and regulations um, allow us to be able to be more effective given the new information. Um, if there is uh, issues in policy or law that we need to change, that's where we come in and we do our part. And so um, Senator Ugin has, has not only um, uh, identified uh, a key double taxation problem that we, we, we really need to look at, but he's also helped to spur dialogue that I think the agency will be able to take back and, and double check. 
but um, I, I really think that everybody's operating under the under the best um, under the best information available, and um, with the existing laws that are in place. And so now it's our job to make sure, with these roundtables and with these these types of bills, that the information is disseminated to all the all the relevant parties, and that if there's necessary changes in the law, that they are changed. So we're gonna we're going to go back to the drawing board, make sure we write this up in a way where we're not going to be having double taxation um, in a narrow scope between prime and subcontractor relationships, and that the law is going to uh, specifically read that way and and not open up the Pandora's box of affecting every single service-oriented uh, business in the community. So does any uh, does anybody else have any other um, information they'd like to share on our roundtable today? If not, I thank everybody for making the time to be here. Uh, Senator Ruggin, thank you for um, Bill 221. Uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn this roundtable at 3.15 this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.